Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Investor Financing Podcast. We have a, a great show today. We're going to talk about um, high performance habits. We're going to talk about multifamily, maybe a little self storage, mobile home parks, uh, creating a life of abundance through investing in real estate. Um, we're going to talk about next level income. That's a really sharp name, by the way. I like that name. Uh, please w- welcome Chris Larson to the show. He's a real estate investor, sales executive, engineer, and author. Uh, and you know what? I've always found this to be true, and I've interviewed a lot of people in, in multifamily that engineers become are like the best investors for whatever reason. In multifamily, all the all the good investors I know, they're all engineers. So I don't know wh- why that is, but it's just the way we you guys think. <laughs> Welcome yeah. to the show. Thanks, Bo. Now I'm excited to be here. Maybe we got a couple more surprises we can weave in here um, for your audience. But yeah, excited to be on and great to see you from across the country here. Yes, I know. How's the weather there? Oh, dude, the weather just broke. It's been raining all week. It's green. It's lush. Uh, it's sunny, and I'm excited for a, a long weekend here. Do you, so. You're in the mountains. So you're like you're. Everything's green by you. Much different than the desert I'm in. <laughs> oh yeah, and I man, I love it out west. I love I love being in the desert. I've rafted the Grand Canyon, as you can see. That's one of my favorite um, parts of the trip that we were on here behind me. Um, trip of a lifetime, but. Yeah, Asheville, North Carolina, which is where we live, is it's up in the mountains in North Carolina. It's in, it's kind of in between um, the the Piedmont and Tennessee, and we're actually in a temperate rainforest. A lot of people don't realize that. So we're in we're in the mountains. It rains a lot. It's just super dense with flora and fauna. It's a wonderful place if you like to be outside or you just like to come and drink beer and eat, eat good food. That sounds like a great place, for sure. So um, can you walk us back just? Um... You were in the. You were an engineer, obviously, and then you did like medical sales, I believe, when I was studying up on exactly. you. And and now that's kind of your passion is to help other people in medical sales um, learn about the next level income, uh, meaning like there's a better way. There's at least you know you most medical sales people are highly paid W two, right, and they're getting taxed excessively high they don't understand they don't know about cost segregation they don't know about all this great stuff on the other world of multifamily so that's really how did how did this transition from like you're you're in medical sales you know doing very well uh, and then all of a sudden you just say hey i gotta get into something different and how did how did that happen yeah, so I'll um, yeah I'll kind of tell tell my story in the transition and and by the way if you're listening today and you want to dive a little bit deeper into the story or you want to see you know details on anything and data we talked about the engineering side of me um, get a copy of my book nextlevelincome.com I'll give it to you for free today nextlevelincome.com click on the book link put your address in and I'll send you a copy if you're here in the um, not only the United States but also Canada so yeah it's so many people ask me that question, Bo, which is, hey, you were in sales. Why did you you know, get into real estate? And the answer is, I bought my first real estate property at 21 because I didn't want to be an engineer. And then I ran out of money. So I had to find a way to create more capital. And I found medical device sales. So I always joke. I said, my advisor pulled me aside in college and said, hey, Chris, you're not smart enough to be an engineer and you got too much personality. So maybe you should try something different. <laughs> but um, I was fortunate enough to find medical device sales and I got to work in ORs for um, almost 18 years, 12 of those years I was on call. And it was, it was lucrative, but it was also very trying. And what I mean is like I worked, you know, I had one seven month stretch without a day off. I slept in the hospital three nights in a row. Um, being on call for surgeries. It's, it's a great career, but it's also, it just, it just wears you down. So what I love about real estate, Bo, and I, we can talk about specifically, you know, multifamily and commercial and, and why I gravitate towards that, but it's a great compliment towards anyone that's a professional, a high income earner that wants to create a secondary source of income, next level income, as we like to call it, passive income that can give you a plan B, that plan. So when you get to the point, like I did, where you said, you know what, I don't want to be on call anymore. I'm sick of missing my kids games. I want to coach my son's team. I want to be there for my wife's birthday. I can do that. Now I was able to make that choice. That's awesome. And so you, you, 
you were in real estate. Did you buy any more properties as you were working in, in it, or did you just yeah. pretty much, you were buying smaller multifamilies when you were working your job or? So I did it the wrong way. Don't do what I did. And that's part of the reason I, I wrote my book and we have the podcast and the website now is because I want, I want to teach people the shortcut to what took me the long way around, which took me about 15 years to figure out. So no, I bought a bunch of single family properties, which it, it's a great way. You know, I bought single family properties. I managed those for 15 years, but you know, from age 21 to about 31, I, I just managed those properties and I thought, Hey, I, if I can pay these off, you know, I'll be, I'll be set. What I realized was the rates of return that I was getting in those properties were about half of what I could get into multifamily. So what I did, I transitioned from being a single family owner and operator to a multifamily investor. And what I found was I got higher rates of return. I got better tax advantages. So you mentioned, you know, if you're an accredited investor, if you're making more than $200,000 a year, I mean, shoot, you know, you know, if you're living in California, Bo, I mean, I know people that are paying 50% of their income in taxes, you know, for every extra dollar they earn. And that's a really, really tough way to become wealthy. So what I found was, you know, I could invest and get better after tax returns in multifamily. And then ultimately with my partner, I started buying multifamily properties. And as a multifamily investor, I could gain more control, gain even better tax benefits. And that even, that even fast tracked my path out of the medical device industry as well. So your first bigger multifamily deal, did you, you had a partner, was it a syndication? Were you just uh, in it as an LP or were you actually a GP in it? So when I first started, I was straight, I was a strictly an, a limited partner, an LP. And then after about three years, we syndicated our first deal. We partnered up with the original group we were investing with. And now today I have, I have three main partners that I work with. We buy, as you mentioned, multifamily, which is still the core of our personal portfolio. It's also the core of what we do with investors, but we've also branched out and added self-storage hotels, mobile home parks, and actually my, uh, the thing I'm most personally excited about here recently are car washes as well. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Car washes are cash flow machines. Cash cows, baby. Yeah, I know. I, I look at all those businesses because it's like, it's just amazing. Are you guys yeah. buying or building new or, or buying or acquiring existing? Yes. So <laughs> we're, uh, we, we've been very successful acquiring current locations, but you know, we also are open to, to buying locations where, where we build as well. But uh, most of our model is buying current locations and converting them or rebranding them to our brand, which is Hurricane Car Wash. And uh, we're looking at the express tunnel model. So, you know, you have the full service where you go and you have a bunch of people washing your cars. Um, you have the self-service where you do it yourself. You know, maybe you have the, the hose and you just push the different buttons. Um, or you have what we, we focus on, which is the express tunnel model where you drive up, you pull your car through in a couple minutes, you come out the other side, you can vacuum it, or you can be on your way, depending on, you know, what your preference is or how much time you have that day. Yeah, that's cool. That's definitely, and I like it too, because you can finance them with SBA um, and you can get pretty high leverage. Although if you're doing it as a syndication, you're not going to most likely do it as with SBA financing, but that's, that's great. So that's, um, and then do you, are you buying them in, 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 um, throughout or mostly in North Carolina or what's the mo plan there? Just cause you, you probably need more p a boot on the ground to like the maintenance and everything. Yeah, you're exactly right. So we built out our own operating team. So we're able to scale quite efficiently. And, um, you mentioned, you know, getting back to engineers, we actually have an engineer, mechanical, chemical engineer that's running the car wash operation because, you know, if you can run the machines efficiently and keep them going, if you can make sure the chemicals are mixed properly, you can save a ton of money. And then really it's, you know, what I love is it's a very simple sales process to teach our teams how to do it. And we're doing that um, all up and down the East Coast right now from Maryland all the way down into the Southeast. And we're going to continue to expand that footprint uh, across the United States as well. Wow. And what, what are like usually like the, your costs, your total costs in, in a project like that? Yeah, so it it depends, um, but three to five million isn't unreasonable for a for a location, you know, a high quality location to make sure it's it's one hundred percent upfit. And then, uh, how do you how do you underwrite those deals? It's similar, to, like anything, you got to underwrite. Like, are you guys looking for traffic count, so forth, and, and 
what's the underwriting process? It's just high level because I know it's probably pretty detailed. Yeah. So look, I'm I'm a numbers guy. So we kind of the kind of the um the topic. So you know, being an engineer, you you're taught and look, I don't I don't consider myself an engineer, even though I passed the PE and you know, I worked in a in a very um technically advanced field in, in med device. But you know, in engineering, you're taught to make a set of assumptions solve a problem based on those assumptions and then you iterate and you you constantly improve based upon the either new data or data that comes in and then you go back and do it all over again and man i wish i wish our public uh health officials would have done this during covid you know it's like they made they made some assumptions they went out and they just stuck to them it's like hey guys let's let's constantly look at what's working what's not working and and try to improve upon things um, unfortunately, politicians don't work like engineers because we don't like to admit we're wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas engineers, we want to find out what we're doing wrong and then try to improve upon it. And that's very valuable as an investor as well. So just like you know, solving any problem, solving the problem of, hey, is this a good car wash location or is this a good multifamily location or project? We say, yes, what are the metrics that make sense for this? So with car washes, you have traffic count. So you want to know, hey, are you getting a lot of traffic count by a location? Now, there's some nuances to this. You could have super high traffic count, but if everybody's driving by your location at 70 miles an hour because it's located next to a freeway, you're probably not going to get a lot of people that pull off the freeway at 70 miles an hour into your location. You're going to get a lot better um, traffic into your location if you have a slightly lower traffic count but you're located, say, at a traffic light where people look over and they're like, hey, special today. My car is covered in pollen like a lot of people right now in the southeast and they pull in. We take that data. We also overlay our data from the real estate side so we can look at local income demographics and we can correlate those to who is going to be a likely customer in our location. And we create heat maps and then we decide, OK, we take those heat maps. We look at local um, competition as well. And then we can take all of those factors, and this is, I'm, you know, I'm being very simplistic here, but we can look at all those factors, decide, hey, is this site um, a good site for acquisition, a good potential site for development, or we can also say, hey, is this site, is this site doing well because of these factors or in spite of these factors? Wow, well, that's very good. Yeah. It makes sense. So in your business, it sounds like you have a couple different partners. You partner differently on different deals. Um, what do you do? What's your kind of role? What do you like to do? do you, are you out there raising capital or uh, underwriting or a combination of both? What, where do you kind of like to be? Yeah, so as we've scaled, I mean, when it, was, when it was just me and my one partner, it was easy. Like we just kind of did everything. You know, it's like um, it's like if you're, if, if you're married, you come home and you, well, in, in today's modern world, you know, you probably, you, somebody cleans a little, somebody cooks a little, maybe, you know, like when we, we finished dinner here, you know, one of our kids, uh, you know, pick cleans up if one, one said help, the, uh, one help set the table. Um, but if now you're in a restaurant, you can't all do everything. You can't all cook. You can't all clean. You got the chef in the kitchen, right? You have the manager, you know, that's overseeing everything. You have somebody that's, that's in service that's specializing in that. So it's very similar in our business as well. So, now we have a whole team dedicated towards acquisitions. We underwrote over 500 multifamily deals alone last year. I can't, I can't underwrite a deal, you know, um, 10 deals a week. That's just, it's, we're just, I'm just not going to be able to do that and talk to investors every day. Um, but yes, I look at once, once a deal is passed muster with our team, I'll underwrite it. I'll visit the site. I'll go out, um, you know, I'll do do due diligence on that site and, and go through that. Um, but a lot of my time now, Bo, is spent working with new investors, educating them on you know why we do what we do. And then I let our acquisitions team handle finding good properties. I let our asset management team hand off to them. You know, I'm on quarterly phone calls with the team, making sure everything's running properly. But you know, they also they're not focused on making sure that all the capitals in so we can close on time. They, they expect me and my team on that side to make sure that happens so that they can have a, a high quality asset that they can then be handed off to to run well. Are most of your um, LPs that are coming in now, are they in the medical space? And like you, you're telling them the story of like, 
showing them a little bit about the successes you, you and your team had and like, hey guys, you're, you're doing great. You're making 400 grand a year W2, but you're paying 200 in taxes and what's left, right? You need to build some yeah. legacy. Is that, yeah. is that where you're having a lot of success is most of your investors in the medical world? I have a lot of investors from that space just because, you know, I have a lot of contacts, you know, from, from, um, from that space. But I mean, I have, I have surgeon investors, I have sales executive investors, I have a lot of successful business owners, because, you know, all of these, all of these professionals have something in common, they work a lot, they make a lot of money. But when they stop working, the money stops coming in. Now, business owners, you know, with well-run business owners, sometimes that's not the case, right? You know, they've, they've built out a team and done that. But their concern is what happens when, you know, I, I either sell this business or I, or I don't want to do it anymore. And the issue that business owners or entrepreneurs have, Bo, as you know, is that they don't have the benefits that a W-2 earner has. So W-2 earner, if you're listening, you make, you know, you make good money, you have a 401k. But here's the thing. I found that 401ks produce a lot of anxiety. You, know, you put money in a 401k, you hope that you accumulate enough money and you hope that your rate of return is right. And you hope that you get your safe withdrawal rate right. And you hope that you don't run out of money before you die. That's a lot of anxiety in hoping and all those things. You know, hope is not a strategy for retirement. You know, it might be a strategy to win elections, but it's not a strategy for retirement, in my opinion. A good strategy to create financial independence is to create a passive income stream from investments that not only grow in value, but also kick off income every month, every quarter, every year to cover your expenses. And that's one thing I think we do a terrible job in this country of doing is not only teaching financial independence, but also this, this whole idea of, hey, take a bunch of risk earlier in your, early in your life. Well, if you get up to bat and you try to hit a home run every time, it's the bottom of the ninth and your team's behind, you have to hit a home run. Why not play Moneyball? Love that movie. Love Michael Lewis's book. Why not put a strategy in place where over the next 5, 10, 20 years, you have a strategy to create passive income. And by the time you're 30 or 40 or 50 years old, you don't have to work anymore. Well, now how much risk can you take? You can go work for a company that's going to pay you an equity. Maybe it's going to have you know, a huge exit. You can invest in things that have huge you know, upside potentials, or you can increase the quality of your life. You can go devote time to charities or to your family, um, you know, all of these different things. I think that's a much better way. It's a much more secure way. And again, maybe it's the engineer in me, maybe it's the risk adverse nature um, that I have, but that's the plan that I put in place. And that's where, that's where we ended up with. Yeah. I mean, I think everybody I talk to, everybody, everybody dreams of, of reoccurring revenue, cash flow. Um, you know, mailbox money per se, but you gotta, you gotta develop a plan and you have to have a plan and yeah. your financial advisor, um, is, is probably not financially independent and they probably, um, don't have a menu of investment options that are going to be able to provide you with this consistent income. And they're not, they're probably not going to give you the same options that say a family office that's worth a hundred or two or three or $500 million is going to invest. Cause Dave Ramsey, his advice is for poor people. If you invest like Dave Ramsey suggests, you're not going to end up like those rich families that invest 20 to 30% of their money in cash flowing real estate. You're going to end up waiting until you're 60, 65, 70 years old to retire. And I think that's, uh, I'm, maybe I'm just not patient enough to, to live like that. Yeah, no, it, it's scary. It's scary. I think like something, what was it like? Seventy uh, percent of the like working W two population, if if something happened, they couldn't even get four hundred dollars out of a bank account. Um, you know, and and that's sad. It really is. Um, and I think people need more of this education. So so when did when did you write your book? When was that? When did that come out? And that that came out with your podcast. So yeah, around the same time. So we launched Next Level Income to, with the mission of helping people have the education opportunities and the financial and the um, investment opportunities to achieve financial independence. And we launched in 2019. So the podcast started right at the beginning of 2019, came out with an ebook. I was able to publish the book 
uh, during COVID. Actually, I had it. I put that underway in early 2020, so it was kind of fun because I got to sit home uh, during COVID and did a bunch of uh, podcast tours and different things to promote the book. Um, so yeah, the book's been out, you know, officially for a couple of years with the audio book. Um, the podcast we just hit our hundred episode here not not too long ago, um, so that's been a lot of fun. We've got a ton of information up on the blog. Um, and yeah, we just continue to try to produce more content to help people, like you said, with the mission of achieving financial independence. Hi, if you'd like to book a call with me and discuss SBA financing, whether it's a 7A or 504, or you just don't know where to start, maybe it's a startup business, you're buying an existing business, you're buying a franchise, you're building a new office building, you wanna expand your existing business, we have multiple solutions. I can walk you through the 7A and the 504 and the SBA loan process. And if you have any other questions on any other types of financing, I'm happy to book a call with you. The link's below. Look forward to seeing you soon. The multifamily business right now is a little bit trickier to find deals with rates going up and just such a competitive market. Um, are you guys and you guys are still underwriting deals do you guys underwrite where do you guys own your multifamily assets right now yeah so the, the short answer to the question that we can dive deeper in is yeah it's it's harder to find multifamily deals right now for a lot of different reasons with rates going up and um, the pricing the way it is but we own deals in the carolinas north carolina south carolina georgia um, tennessee um, as well as uh, florida um, and texas are where our multifamily deals are located and it's we've had uh we are on our um third acquisition here this year but yeah deal flows slow down a lot just because it's hard to get the financing right with the way interest rates are and you know we continue to underwrite deals but we're, we're patient we're patient when we buy we're patient when we sell and you know we're not you know we don't have a um a hard timeline you know when we acquire when we sell these assets so we try to be opportunistic on both ends what do you, what's your take over the next 12 or 24 months? Do you think it's going to get a lot worse? Do you think it's going to be a mild recession? What would, you, what, what would your guess be? Ooh, one of my favorite topics. So I just did a podcast on this um, for my 100 episode talking about my predictions for the future. So um, again, I'm a data guy and I grew up, both my parents were in the real estate industry and in the savings and loan crisis, the early 90s, they both lost their jobs. I lost my internship um, after the, uh, the tech market crash in the late 90s. Obviously, um, I think everybody knows the story of the Great Recession at this point. And I stopped buying properties in 2005, really concerned with kind of where the metrics were going. And then in 2019, I started to talk about how I thought we were up for a mid cycle, a mid real estate cycle slowdown, and people needed to be really concerned. And what we did was we pivoted from higher value add properties to you know, higher quality value add and higher quality newer properties because they're going to perform better during these parts of the cycle. So if you look back over time, real estate cycles go in about 18 to 19 year cycles, about 18 and a half uh, year cycles, 18.6 to be precise. The bottom of the last cycle is in 2012. So the, the last cycle, 2008, four years down, ended in 2012. You run that out, we're talking about 2030 before we start up on the next cycle. You back out four years, I know I'm going quickly, so go back and listen to this. 2026 is my prediction for when this cycle ends. Now, will the economy ebb and flow between now and then? Yeah, I think so, especially with you know the perversion that we have with the Fed that's coming in and messing with interest rates and, and doing all these things. But the underlying demographics and the underlying economics specifically of real estate, in my opinion, are going to remain strong for the next few years. And the reason is we have, well, there's a couple of reasons, but we have unprecedented household formation. So the millennials are actually a bigger generation than baby boomers. They're moving out, they're forming households. There's not enough homes. There's not enough apartments because we underbuilt for over a decade. We're just starting to catch up now. Um, I write about all of this in my book that you can kind of walk through. The other issue is we have $6 trillion of liquidity sitting on the sidelines, 6 trillion, looking for yield, looking for investments. That is going to push up values as, as people look for a place to put their money. The other thing is people say, well, Chris, housing is more unaffordable than it's ever been. 
Well, I would say according to what metric, if you look at housing today, housing as a per, uh, cost, like if you talk about a mortgage or uh, rental rates as a percentage of disposable income is still affordable by definition. So if we look at the metric of that, 100 is affordable, above 100 is affordable, below 100 is unaffordable. We're at like 125 to 130 right now. Again, I don't have time to go into all that um, today, but my point is, there's, yeah, there's some cracks in housing because interest rates have gone up and inventory is not high enough. And, you know, but in general, all of these things are going to provide buoyancy to the market. So I think, um, you know, we need to watch in the next couple of years for a stock market crash. And then after that, you have to be very careful of the market. I think you need to buy high quality properties, cash flow properties, cash flow businesses, start to put some cash in the bank for the next downturn so you are prepared and you aren't run over when those opportunities come out beautiful i like that that was a good a good answer i think you touched on that what what is your what does an average day look uh look like for you yeah so um i used to i used to be forced to get up because i had to had to go into the hospital and, and be ready for surgeries. But um, I, used to, I raced bicycles for 20 years. So I would get up and I train on my bike early in the morning, about five o'clock. Um, I've converted my schedule a little bit now. I have two boys, 10 and 12. So I get up, I still get up at five most days and I work till about seven o'clock till my boys are up, get them out the door, usually work out mid morning, um, nine to 11. I try to meditate every morning, try to get a workout in, come back, restart my work day, um, have a healthy lunch, you know, work until my boys come home from school. And then in the evening, um, we have some family time. But um, as we were talking before the show, I have a sauna. So I try to hop in the sauna at the end of each of my each of my days um, and then uh, then wind down. But when it comes to like what I'm actually doing during the day, looking at deals, talking to investors, um, I've been on the road a lot the last month, um, either visiting properties, going to some different trade shows and masterminds um, that I'm a part of. And then yeah, we weave in a lot of uh, a lot of family travel as well. A lot of my weekends are are devoted to my boys, to lacrosse games, to riding bikes, and um, trying to have as much fun as possible. And you know, working enough and getting out there and trying to move the needle in terms of the impact I'm having out there. But really making sure I put first things first, and that's uh, my family and my health. Awesome. So people can find you. They can go to nextlevelincome.com. Uh, they nextlevelincome.com. Absolutely. They can find the book. Uh, the, the podcast and and some some of your blogs where you dive deep into a lot of these uh, engineer in engineering terms that we're we're interested in. But it, this was a great episode. I uh, appreciate your time. It was uh, I can I can tell you have a lot of passion for it. And and uh, the car wash industry always appealed to me. So that was pretty cool. That I didn't know that about you. So that's that's nice that you guys are are doing that. And it sounds like you're growing that pretty big. So that's great. Yeah, we're loving it, Bo. And um, yeah, it's been great, great seeing you here today. Hope you enjoy your weekend. You get some rest. And yeah, if you're listening today, again, get a copy of our book, Next Level Income at our website, nextlevelincome.com. Click on the book link. Uh, take advantage of that. And if there's anything I can do, any specific questions you have, reach out to me, chris at nextlevelincome.com. Thank you so much, guys. Hope you enjoy this episode and we'll see you on the next one.